Alright, welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to pick up the story of the war in Iraq in May of 2003. President George W. Bush has given his mission accomplished speech aboard the USS Abraham Lincoln, and quite frankly, things look quite good. It's at this moment that the Coalition Provisional Authority is formed under the leadership L. Paul Bremer. Between May 2003 and June 2004, L. Paul Bremer and the Coalition Provisional Authority will be responsible for the situation in Iraq, a situation that deteriorates sharply. It's what a guest documentary calls the lost year. We're now going to watch good deal of that documentary. It's an excellent production, which looks at what happened during this critical time in the war. Before we get to that, let's meet the cast of characters. General Tommy Franks, CENTCOM commander, man responsible for the successful invasion in March, May of 2003. 22nd of May, he resigned. By July 7th, he was out of Iraq, out of the army. L. Paul Brimmer, Coalition Provisional Authority Director, man who arrived on May 11th, and as we are going to see, in no uncertain term began to screw things up on May 11th. General Tommy Franks was replaced General John Abizade, CENTCOM commander. General Abizade would serve in this position until March 2007, in the major shakeup of the Iraq strategy known as the Surge, which will be the subject of our last lecture. To take care of the situation on the ground, General Abizade and the Pentagon appointed General Ricardo Sanchez as the MNF. I commander, multinational force, Iraq commander, took over in June 2003 once Tommy Franks had exited stage left. However, his tenure would be short. By June 2004, General Ricardo Sanchez would no longer be the commander of multinational force Iraq. His departure would coincide with the departure of L. Paul Bremer. In his place, the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, made what many people consider to be an unusual choice. General George Casey, a man who had never commanded troops in the field. General Casey would serve as the MNFI commander from June 2004 until February 2007. He, along with Abizaid, would be casualties change in strategy, a change in strategy known as clear, hold, and build. Iraqis are looting on a grand scale. It is a clear sign that while war might be ending, there is trouble ahead. Stuff happens. Freedom's untidy, and free people are free to make mistakes and commit crimes and do bad things. They're also free to, to, to live their lives and, and do wonderful things. And that's what's going to happen here. The Secretary of Defense and his oldest political ally, the Vice President, had led the effort to take down Saddam Hussein's regime. They had a simple plan for post-war Iraq, handed over to their hand-picked candidate, an Iraqi exile. Ahmed Chalabi, leader of the Iraqi National Congress, INC. It was primarily Wolfowitz who was in charge of the INC and Chalabi. Their idea was that Chalabi would go in and set up an interim government for Iraq. The Secretary of State, along with his deputy, Richard Armitage, strongly opposed Chalabi. It was both a policy dispute and it became, unfortunately, quite personal. In what sense? 
Well, friendships were dashed, uh, et cetera. I mean, long-standing 20-year, 25-year friendships. You and who? Me and Wolfowitz, uh, for instance. I, uh, we'd worked together uh, handsomely for years and years, and uh, unfortunately our friendship has soured over this. The whole government turned into two camps. One of them is just totally opposed uh, to Chalabi, and the other one was so pro-Chalabi. What should they have been thinking about? Iraq. The week the statue of Saddam fell in Baghdad, the U.S. military, under orders from the civilians at the Pentagon, delivered Ahmed Chalabi into southern Iraq. The plan was to allow Iraqis to participate in their own liberation in some form or another. And of course the State Department was dead against it, everybody was dead against it. They were irritated at the fact that uh, um, Chalabi was being flown in, and it took the personal intervention of friends of Mr. Chalabi in the Pentagon to make it happen. They called it Operation Crescent Rising, Chalabi and his 700 troop militia. What I want to do was participate in the liberation of Iraq and also uh, to show that we can operate uh, in, on Iraqi territory uh, without much U.S. help. The Americans hoped Chalabi and his army of exiles could get in on the fighting so he could be seen by Iraqis as a potent leader. People wanted to trust him. He, if he worked out, he was the answer to everything. He could come in with a, his own army and help us take Iraq. He could run Iraq. He could put people in there and, and, and run them. the ministries. I mean, it, it could all be in one package. And that's where I think it was coming from. Few in Iraq had heard of Chalabi. In the beginning, he drew a curious crowd of onlookers. But his efforts to inspire Iraqis to rally behind him quickly failed. My overarching observation uh, is that those folks were generally not well received. People were not responding to them like we might have hoped. They, they never were significantly engaged, they never significantly contributed, at least in my mind. So Chalabi was removed to a military base to keep him out of the way. It would take him a week to pull enough strings to get to Baghdad. Any hope Rumsfeld and Cheney had for a quick handoff was over. In Baghdad, matters were going from bad to worse. The looting, of course, went from the spontaneous looting of ministries. It pretty soon got into the homes, the neighborhoods, the shops. It then became carjackings and kidnappings and unstructured crime, then organized crime, and you could even probably do a DNA chain to, to the insurgency. That was the spark. The administration refused to admit they had trouble in Iraq. Rumsfeld was the chief spokesman. Yeah, I, I picked up a newspaper today, and I couldn't believe it. I read eight headlines that talked about chaos, violence, unrest, and it just was henny penny, the sky is falling, I've never seen anything like it. It's just unbelievable how people can, can take that away from what is happening in that country. The idea is we would act unilaterally, we would win big, and then other nations that would see our success and would want to join in. That was the plan. I've heard a former American diplomat refer to this as the, the ding-dong, the witch's dead uh, school of regime change, but that's what it was. You know, we go in, you kill the wicked witch, the munchkins jump up, they're grateful, and then we get in the hot air balloon and we're out of there. Only one week after the fall of Baghdad, the Pentagon signaled as much. What's your feeling about being here in Baghdad, sir? Oh, I think it's absolutely terrific. You know why? Why, sir? Because I get a chance to visit these people who've been doing this damn hard work for a while. That's probably about all I'm going to tell you right now, okay? A very striking thing happened. General Franks gave guidance that his commanders should be prepared to withdraw all American forces except for a little more than a division, which would remain, by September 2003. 110,000 troops were being told to prepare to leave. <laughs> 